Nation, Rob McGregor, welcome you to a place where all kinds of phenomena flourish. Voices whisper, ancient secrets, signs and symbols are abundant. UFOs, ETs, ghosts, and even the dead move about freely. Here we meet authors, researchers, and investigators of the mysterious, the strange, and of the inexplicable anomalies that surround us. Step out of the everyday world and take a journey into the mystical underground. producer John Posey. You can go to themysticalunderground.com where we make regular blog posts and uh, where you can find out about our books. Among them are The Seven Secrets of Synchronicity, Synchronicity and the Other Side, Sensing the Future, Aliens in the Backyard, among others. Our most recent nonfiction book is The Shift, Reports from the Mystical Underground. Trisha's latest novel is White Crows and Rob's latest novel is Tulpas. Our guest today is Mark Ireland, author and the co-founder of Helping Parents Heal, an organization with more than 24,000 members that assist bereaved parents worldwide. He has participated in mediumship research studies conducted by the University of Arizona and the University of Virginia, and he's currently operating a medium certification program. His first book was called Soul Shift, and his new book is Persistence of the Soul. Mark lives in Kamas, Washington. Welcome, Mark. We've been looking forward well, to talking Mark. with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the invite. I'm looking forward to our chat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll ask the first questions here. Our uh, question is, uh, what motivated you to investigate and write about mediumship and the afterlife evidence? Kind of a broad question. Good question to start. Yeah. Well, I actually grew up with a father who had these abilities. He was pretty uh, amazing. His name was Richard Ireland. So, you know, you, you live in a household where your father knows everything that's going on. You can't get away with anything. It's, it's a little troubling. But um, the, the other part of that, besides just the psychic stuff, was that I saw him provide spirit communication to people who were grieving the loss of someone. And it was highly specific with names and hobbies and all kinds of things that people could identify. And at, at a young age, I, I thought, wow, there really is more. Um, and it just touched me and it made me never really fear death. So whereas a lot of folks have to uh, rely on blind faith, I felt like I had more of a knowledge. Well, you um, also lost your son, which is to a parent, that's like, it's devastating. Right. Now and that's where I was going next. So even though I grew up with that father who had those abilities, I took a more conventional path. Um, I'm, how many of us want to be our parent, right? So yeah. um, I got a degree. I went into business, got married at a young age and had a couple of kids and was just kind of cruising along doing the regular old um, business lifestyle thing. And then unexpectedly, my youngest son, who was 18 at the time, passed. And that is what that was really the catalyst that drew me back into my dad's field really to do a deeper dive into it and understand it at a deeper level than I had as a young, as a young person. When you went to college and uh, often, you know, on your own life, did you reject uh, what your father was doing or did you just not think about it or what was your. Uh, uh, I didn't reject it at all. I was proud of my dad. I had to actually take yeah. friends to see him a lot, his live demonstrations. Yeah. So I was proud of him. I just didn't, he always said, Mark, you're very psychic or he'd tell people I was psychic. And I thought, no, I'm not psychic. I can't do what you do. But I think <laughs> yeah. it was just, I didn't understand that he was at a different level than most folks. <clears throat> and um, what what it meant to be psychic, you know, it goes in varying degrees. We all are psychic to some degree. We all have an intuition and we can either develop it or not. And I think we have it in varying degrees. It's just like somebody, anybody can play guitar, but not everyone's going to be Eric Clapton, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, that, so, so I didn't reject it. I just didn't want to be my dad. Yeah. I, I just uh, took yeah. it as a path. 
different people too. I was more practical and he was more live for the moment. Uh, what was it like? It's unusual for, for somebody like your dad to also be a minister. How did that? Oh, it, it's not within the, the spiritualist tradition, uh, within uh -huh. the main Christian tradition, probably less common, but I think there are probably people in, you know, more mainstream churches that have that ability and they just don't talk about it or, or acknowledge that. But he, his, <clears throat> the, really the breakout event for his family to figure out that he was different was at the age of five, he went into the uh, Columbus, Ohio Children's Hospital for corrective surgery on his eyes because he was born cross-eyed. And um, after mm. the surgery, his eyes were cupped and bandaged and they had him actually strapped into a bed because they were afraid he'd mess with the bandages. And this nurse was walking by and felt sorry for him. And she she said, I'll let you out of the bed if you promise not to touch the bandages. And he agreed. So she, she went on around. She came back and he was bouncing a wall, a ball against the wall and catching it. She thought the bandages had been taken off, but they weren't. So then she brought wow. some doctors in to observe this. And then they put him in his bed and then played games. like put one doctor at the foot of the bed and another at the doorway and asking who's standing in front of you. And he got it right every time. So Jeez. that was kind of the beginning of knowing that he was extremely clairvoyant. And um, by the age of 13, he did his first public demonstration in a, in a circle. The, the way that this happened or evolved was he, he stumbled into a spiritualist church at the age of 13. And there was a man giving messages so he went in there and his best buddy had just died recently. The two of them were playing in a creek um, and the boys had secret names for one another. So anyhow, he goes into this church service and this minister gives him a message and he says, uh, Richard Ireland, he calls my dad out and my dad's just here. He says, well, I have a young man on the other side here and he's giving me a, a name for himself to tell you and it's Paisy. Well, that was the secret code name wow. uh, of his buddy. So he was really intrigued by this and then that man later became his mentor. So when he was, I think, 17, eight, he graduated at age 17, and then he uh, ended up getting uh, ordinate, uh, ordained through the NSAC, which is the National Spiritualist mm -hmm. Association of Churches. And he was a touring minister um, and served in a couple locations for a number of years. And then 1960, he started his own church that was a non-denominational church. And really where he was going with this was not really push dogma on people, but more um, to provide an environment where people could see what the gifts of the spirit and to huh. understand they're more than just a physical body and a brain, that that there is a spiritual nature to us. Um, and then and then for people to kind of make up their own minds about their own truth. But uh, that's that's how we got into ministry. Huh. That's yeah. fascinating. So, so, so he was not only able to uh, communicate uh, with the other side, but he also had these psychic, psychic abilities. And one of the things I read about uh, in your book that I found fascinating was how uh, people would give him uh, numbers, sealed numbers, and he was blindfolded and he was able to read those numbers. There was one uh, man that uh, came in and he had uh, letters he wrote in, I think it was numbers 385. He put it in red and put it in, in a sealed in an envelope and handed it to him. And he had, and uh, your father Richard had a blindfold on, and he he got the color and the numbers right. Which uh, you know the guy said the the chances of that happening are so incredibly un unlikely that he just had to you know b uh, believe it. Uh, so my question is, uh, other people who skeptics and people who are you know uh, very you know materialistic are into are going to say, okay, did he go to the lottery? Did he ever, did he, or Las Vegas? Well, back to the story you just mentioned, I just wanted to add on to that and yeah. then I'll answer that for you. But um, yeah. that man was actually not just any man, but it was Helmut Schmidt, who was the second in command at the Duke Parapsychology Laboratory. Right. So oh. Helmut Schmidt, he was a, actually a parapsychologist and he happened to see my dad in a public venue doing a demonstration. And so he wanted to test my dad, you know, not in a lab, but his own lab. Uh -huh. And then he walked to three different tables and each table, he said, give me a number, one to 10. And each gave him a number and he ended up with three, eight, five. He put that in a sealed envelope. And on the outside, he wrote, please tell me what this says inside. So he sent it up to my dad, who was already blindfolded. He didn't open the envelope and he said, you want to know what's in here? It's the number three, eight, five and red ink. So, <laughs> yeah. But as far as using wow. it, for, my dad was often asked that question. He said that he yeah. felt that using his gift for gambling or for personal gain would be a misuse. And he'd either 
suffer some sort of karmic <laughs> retribution for it or he would lose it. So <clears throat> I did talk hmm. to one of his managers who said that he saw my dad in Las Vegas once standing aside, not playing, but watching a roulette wheel. And he called out the correct number. I think he said seven consecutive times. Wow. But he also said that if my dad actually tried to do it for himself, it didn't work. Wow. So it kind of tells you there's there's some ethics to it. Yeah. <laughs> now, however, so, yeah. I will I will say that he did use it once that I was aware of, but not really for major gain. We, uh, they would have horse races in Phoenix at Turf Paradise. So he would have a group of people go there on the weekend and my wife to be, who's now my wife for many years. And I went there one day <clears throat> and they, people would, excuse me, <clears throat> they would um, bet on the horses throughout the day and win, lose, whatever. But at the very end, he would pick the winner to pay for the lunch. Um, and so <laughs> the, the day that I, That's the day great. that I was there that I remembered, he, he said, pick this horse, Mark. And it was a really long shot. And I'm like, and me being Mr. Conservative, I go and I bet it to show instead of to win or even place. <laughs> and sure enough, the horse won. So I think I got $40 or something like that. Where I got hundreds. <laughs> yeah. But uh, oh, did you, did you or other people ever ask him, oh, can you give me the, the six lottery numbers for today? Or, uh, you know, would he answer that kind of question? He wouldn't. I mean, I, I never yeah. asked for that. I just felt like yeah. he already yeah. stated how he wouldn't use it for that purpose. So it wasn't really right for me to ask for that. He would get right. asked that a lot by people, but I, I don't bet. really yeah. remember him doing it. He might give somebody a hint for something, but I don't yeah. think he'd flat out say, hey, here's your winning number. Now, Mark, yeah. is anybody yeah. else in, in the family psychic like your dad was? Well, it, it does run in family lines. Uh, parapsychologists, psychical researchers have determined that. Mm -hmm. And I have it to some degree. It's just more sporadic with me. Uh -huh. My uncle had it. So like, as an example, um, when my son passed, we he was on a mountain. We didn't really know the cause of death. And my uncle was still alive at the time. My father had been gone for 12 years. And so I talked to my uncle the day of his, my son's passing. And he said, can I do anything for you? And I said, well, if you get any kind of message or something you could share, I'd really appreciate it. It was the third day I was in the uh, mortuary and we connected by cell phone. And my uncle said, hey, Mark, I want to let you know something. I tried to connect last night and I couldn't get anything. But this morning, your dad came to me and he uh, he wanted you to know that he was there for Brandon when Brandon left his body. And he he was confused at first, but your dad helped him adjust. He wanted you to know that uh, you're the best parents he ever could have had, which is what we like to hear. But then he gave me the cause of death. He said, your dad said Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen in his bloodstream that caused his heart to fail. Uh -huh. Two days later, the autopsy physician called me and told me that he, Brandon had passed from a severe asthma attack that drove his blood oxygen levels down, causing wow. cardiac arrest. So my mm -hmm. uncle gave me the cause of death before the autopsy results were revealed. So, yeah, my uncle had it. My grandmother, my dad's mom, had it. And his his grandmother, my great-grandmother on uh, his father's side would read tea leaves and stuff like that, I guess. So it uh, runs in the families and and myself, like I've had some really unusual experiences, but it's just kind of here and here and there. And I don't know if that's maybe just because I haven't really worked at developing it. But if you want to know any stories, I can share a couple with you if you want. Sure. Hear sure. Yeah. To hear well, one going way back when I was only 18 years old, I think 18 or 19, I was dating a girl. And one night I had a dream and in the dream, I, thought she was seeing another guy and it made me jealous but what was weird was I knew the guy's first and last name and what he looked like <laughs> so the next day I was telling her hey I had this dream last night and it made me jealous uh she goes well tell me more about it and I said no it was just a dream and she's like no <laughs> tell me so I'm like okay well this guy looked so tall he had this color hair and his name was Bob Dooley and she says <laughs> I dated a guy named Bob Dooley in Kansas and he looked just like that so that was kind of <laughs> wacky more recently yeah. though for a three-year stint, um, I was going invited to speak at this spiritualist church in San Francisco called the Golden Gate Spiritualist Church. Uh, this church had been founded in 1924 by a woman named Florence Becker, who by all accounts was very similar to my father and her abilities. Uh, she died in 1970. So, But anyhow, this church for a three-year stint had me come talk, but each time I would bring a medium friend, Tina Powers, with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Tina 
said, hey, Mark, I think you're going to get a message to share with the congregation. Will you share it? I'm like, well, sure. If I get something, I'll share it. She kept pounding this into me. Are, are you <laughs> sure you'll share it? Yes, yes. Even the day we walk into the church, she's like, Mark, do you promise to share anything you might get? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> Tina. So we go in about a half hour before I'm supposed to talk. And I go into their healing room and I sit on a bench to an organ or a piano, quiet myself, shut my eyes. <clears throat> and I was just kind of trying to just be relaxed to prepare for my talk. But at the same time, I was open to anything that might pop in. So while I'm sitting there, this name pops into my mind. It's Max. And then immediately after that, Maxine. I thought, well, maybe it's Maxine and not Max. Now, I didn't hear it. I didn't see it. It just came to me like an idea or a thought would. Uh, and that's all I got was those two names. <clears throat> so I go up, I do my talk. And at the end, I'm like, well, Tina made me promise that if I got anything, I'd share it with uh, with you. Do the names Max or Maxine mean anything to anyone here? And uh, the pastor, his jaw dropped. And he's like, well, Max and Maxine were twins born to the church founder, Florence wow. Becker. Uh, they were <laughs> delivered stillborn and they grew up on the other side in spirit. He says, that's a, a secret that only a couple long-term church members know. And then he says, I want to show you something. He took me upstairs and showed me a painting. I believe it was done by Florence Becker. It was a landscape and it had a long winding road. He says, see the two little figures at the end of the road? That's Max and Maxine. Jeez. So now I could see why Tina pushed me because it was so subtle to me. It's like I could have just dismissed it and said, oh, that's just my imagination. But yet... They were two highly specific names that aren't that common, and they were very applicable to the church founder. So, huh. so that's a kind of an extreme example of what has happened with me. It's just not all the time. So this was just the words came into your head, or or what? Yeah, just like um, like if you think about a memory coming to you, or a uh -huh. thought popping in, or like an idea. You have an idea like, oh, I'm going to try this. Or that. It just came in like an idea. Huh. So I knew the name. I didn't hear it in an auditory way, and I didn't see it visually. It just came in like, a, a I guess, an idea or a, hmm. a memory or something like that. Do you think Tina knew you were going to pick up on this? Absolutely. That's why she yeah, kept bugging okay. me. <laughs> so she knew this was going to happen. So that's precognition <laughs> on her part, you know? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Mark, uh, I know you recommend people to talk to uh, who are grieving over death of a loved one to talk to mediums uh uh and sometimes you know people don't really uh you know who who are very religious don't really relate to giving them that kind of information for example we just had uh, in the last, what was it, six months, Trisha, uh, a death of someone in the family, uh, Trisha's sister, who was a very healthy person and died quite suddenly. And it was, you know, it was very, very unexpected. And uh, so family members got together and some of the people were very uh, religious and, and we were in really this grieving. <laughs> yeah, and really grieving. And uh, something came to me from Trisha's sister to uh, tell her husband that uh, he was going to be married to not to grieve, but he was going to be married to somebody else in one year. And every when I mentioned that <clears throat> to family members, they said, don't tell him that, don't tell him that. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but eventually you did because he revealed that dream that he'd had. Now, the right. day after Rob told me this, Neil, we were talking with Neil and he says, oh, I had a dream that I was with Mary. We were on the bed and we were hugging and she said, you're with the wrong person. And that's when Rob told him the dream about uh -huh. you're going to be remarried within a year. Yeah. yeah I and, think that, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that uh, synchronistic, synchronistically, he uh, was contacted by uh, someone from his past, a woman named Eve, who uh, I can't remember the story, but she she it wasn't even related to um, the the fact that well she uh, had lost her the, husband. Yeah, like she had lost her before. husband. Yeah, right. So here and these the two started talking. I believe they're still they don't live in the same uh, state. They but email they're still communicating. Yeah. So I keep saying to Neil, Neil, arrange a meeting. You know, this is what <laughs> Mary was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, um, when it comes to the whole issue of grieving and the role of uh, mediumship reading and healing the grief, it's just one component. There's a lot of different things mm -hmm. that go into healing grief. 
and I, you know, I'm not saying you should get a reading in lieu of therapy or anything else, but it can be a, a positive thing if someone's open to it, um, to have that connection. For me, it was huge, really with the Helping Parents Heal organization that we've, that I, that you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> I've seen people come through that were really despondent in a deep, dark place, uh, and then come out the other side much better. And I think I've observed five different factors, the mediumship, or just openness to afterlife evidence, whether it's uh -huh. reading books about it or or uh, having a direct experience through a dream or a meditation, uh, all those things could be helpful. But as far as the the religious aspect, my father thought it was rather odd, and I do too, that you you know a lot of traditional folks in the mainly in the Christian uh, um, church think that there's something wrong with this or that it's bad. But mm -hmm. really, the Bible supports these things. Now, it's contradictory, too, because there's 66 different books in the Protestant Bible, and they're kind of all over the place, and a lot of things contradict one another. But in, mainly in the New Testament, you'll find examples of like um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the, the Apostle Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And when he lists them, they're all these things. They're the same things. Huh. Interesting. He's expressing them as a positive and things to be developed. So, um, and then Jesus is, you know, seen talking to dead people in the story of the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, and the disciples supposedly, you know, they say, witness that. So mm -hmm. that's mediumship if you're talking to dead people, right? Um, and I, I think the thing is, it's just people are taught that from a traditional perspective uh -huh. without really taking the time to really look at the scripture and read those passages and understand. And that's really where my dad bases church around the whole idea that gives us mm. to show that this is just, this is real stuff. It's not just some fairy tale from long ago. I think really the way this kind of feeling evolved within the church was that back at the time when, um, when Galileo was uh, punished by the church right. because the earth goes around the sun, that whole thing caused a split between science and religion. Uh -huh. It, that yeah. that wound's never been healed to this day and the people on the science side were challenging church leaders to say well if these miracles and things you know are supposed to happen why can't you do any of them and so they said oh it was reserved for a special period of time it was a special dispensation and that'll happen again in the future but it's not happening right now mm -hmm. and that's where the people get this idea but there's nothing in scripture that says that that's the case that was just a storyline created to try and defend the church against uh, attack by the the science uh, yeah. by academia. Mark, what what does yeah. your organization? How, how do you deal with bereaving parents? I mean, do you do you have psychotherapists? Do you have mediums who? How's it work? So um, the whole thing started really back in the earliest form of it was two thousand nine, and I wasn't the founder of that. It was called Parents United and Lost. It was a single mm -hmm. group in Carefree, Arizona. Um, I met this woman named Elizabeth Boyce and I introduced to her through another medium because I was promoting my first book at the time. Her son had also passed on a mountain, but it was in the Himalayas. He was on a school trip with the University of Arizona and they went up the mountain too rapidly and he had died of altitude sickness. Oh my God. So, so I, the person who um, I met her through, I gave her a copy of my first book and said, give this to the mother and here's my contact information if she'd like to talk. So it was like a day or two later, she read my book and like in one sitting and she goes, I loved your book and I want to meet you and your wife. So we met and then we talked for a while. She goes, well, I've got this group called Parents United in Law. So I'm going to have my first meeting, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'd like you to be my first speaker. Would you do that? Okay. And I'm like, okay. So there's 30 or 40 people there. And then uh, it went great. And then she kept having them like once a month. Well, fast forward to 2011, I was leaving a job and trying to decide what I wanted to do next. And Tina Powers, who I mentioned earlier, said to me, Mark, I think your real mission in life is to help parents who have lost a kid just like you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can think about starting an organization like that. So I gave it some thought and I thought, you know, <clears throat> there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Elizabeth already has a, a group that works, but maybe you know we could expand it out, blueprint what she does and have other locations. And then I could put a website up and we could start doing a uh -huh. newsletter. So I approached her with the idea. And she said, oh, yes. And I said, and maybe a different name, like Helping Parents Heal. She goes, oh, I love that name. Let's do that. So it just grew like rapid fire. And now we have 175 affiliate locations worldwide, wow. 26,000 members now. Um, 
up from the 24,000 you mentioned, because that's mm -hmm. how fast it's growing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and we do a conference every other year that it'll draw a thousand people from around the world. A physical so, conference or virtual? A physical in-person conference. Uh -huh. it'll be oh. So, um, it, to, but to answer your original question, that's more about the evolution of the organization. What we do really, there's there's a number of things. I think first off, just bringing people together who have the same right. situation is very helpful because you can form new friendships and bonds. That's very healing. Um, and then we do bring in speakers and presenters of all types. We've had like Dr. Raymond Moody, who's uh -huh. the father of the near death experience right. research, you know, um, and that term uh, he coined the term near death experience. We've had. Uh, some top mediums, Suzanne Giesman, Suzanne Wilson, Gordon Smith was just with us. He's one of the very best in the world. Um, we'll, uh, we'll have therapist talk sometime. So um, it's just a wide array. And then in our conference, we're going to have a number of really, uh, like Dr. Mary Neal, she's another near-death uh. experiencer. So um, really what I've observed in the course of people that came in despondent and left better was what I call the five pillars of healing. The first one is, um, support from family and friends. Not everybody has that. Not everybody's family is well adjusted, but hopefully if you do have that, that helps. That can contribute to healing. Number two, I just mentioned, it's getting to know someone with the same situation mm -hmm. and forming relationships there. The third pillar is providing service. Um, that could be working at a soup kitchen. It could be um, working for a foundation, but just something to give to somebody else because it comes back to you and it helps you heal. The fourth pillar is um, release feelings of guilt. Most parents blame themselves in some way. They'll say, I could have done this. I should have done that. Uh, and that's just a waste of time and energy. They need to let that go. And just by the same token, if you're holding on to anger and not forgiving someone else that you hold responsible, be it a doctor or maybe somebody who was involved in an accident that you feel had a role in that, uh, if the longer you hang on to that, the more it just hurts you. And then uh, the fifth pillar is being open to afterlife evidence, because that's the hope piece. It's like the piece that says it's not over They're You know, they're not gone. They're just it's, you can still have a relationship. It's just mm -hmm. different, different now. Hmm. <clears throat> um, there's a spiritualist so, community in central Florida, Casadega. Have you heard of that? I have. I have not. You, you, you ought to go there. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> fascinating the little community. And it's there used to be tons of them. I know there's Lilydale in New York. Right. And this is the sister community. OK. Uh, I mean, I've not been to the I've, I've been to one called Camp Chesterfield when I was uh -huh. a, when I was a young boy in Indiana. I don't even know if it's still there or not. And I think, you know, you're there are a lot of mediums I know who really, you know, some of them have gone there and checked it out and others just do their own thing. I think mm -hmm. there's just a lot of gifted people around the world with or without that structure or part of that. Yeah. Or not part of that. Um, and a lot of them have gone to the Arthur of Finley College uh, uh -huh. in uh, in England for mm -hmm. training and development too. Um, so, but no, I've not been to that one. Well, mm. Google it. <laughs> okay. What's it called again? Uh, uh, Casadega. Okay. C-A-S-S-A-D-A-G-A. It's a really Got small it. community, but I, I first discovered it when I was in graduate school and somebody said, hey, Trish, given your interest, have you ever gone to Casa de And I said, I've never even heard of it. Where is it? So I went down, I drove five or six hours the following weekend and got blown away by my yeah, It's a little village and everybody has little picket fences and little signs <laughs> out that say they're mediums or, you know, and uh, you just That's walk around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah right. What city yeah. is it nearest? So, New Orlando, Orla about Orlando. Oh, okay. half an hour north. Got yeah. it. Well, yeah. So yeah. they get people from flight. Disney, too. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're in Washington, right? So you're across the country. Yeah, I'm I'm just across the river from Portland, Oregon, but I'm oh, okay. in Washington. Camas, Washington is oh. just a, basically a suburb of Portland, Oregon. Yeah. But I still oh, have, a, okay. I have a place in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I'm from, too, because it, it gets pretty yeah. dreary up here in the winter. I bet. Yeah. Well, okay. Scottsdale that, that, is really bloomed. Yeah. That that name Camas, that's kind of a synchronicity, a bedroom community. I mean, Camas in Spanish means bed, bed beds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you um, about do you find that psychotherapists are open to mediums or are they, they feel of their competitors, or is it a combination? You know, I don't know. I th I think there are some psychotherapists who um would be open to it and they are 
uh, spiritual people. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a Dr. Alan Botkin, yes. but he, he, he had done, um, he had accidentally by accident developed a process uh, called induced af after death communication while treating some uh, PTSD people, uh, soldiers from Vietnam. And uh, it would involve EMDR, which is, uh, what is it? It's like a rapid eye movement process where he'd flash something in front of their eyes. But at the same time, he had some unique nuance to that process. But whatever he did got people into this altered state where they would actually see and communicate with the people that had died. <laughs> in some cases, people they had killed in battle and were forgiven by them, which was extremely healing. Or in another case, this other soldier had more or less adopted this little Vietnamese girl and loved her like a daughter, and she got killed in battle. Um, and in this experience, he saw her and, and reunited with her. So um, that's an, a different, not your everyday psychotherapist, oh. but but that was a pretty phenomenal thing. And I actually know a couple who went to somebody now, Botkin's retired, but I think he's developed um, training for other uh, therapists to learn how to do that. This couple I met, they went to get have that process from someone in the Bay Area. And um, when they went, the husband went first, and it took quite a while, like hours, but he finally got into that. And he saw his son, and, he, and the son told him, Dad, this isn't going to work for mom. And then he <laughs> also said, ask mom about the color code book. So that was his session. When he was done, he didn't say a word to the wife. The wife went in. It didn't work for her. She couldn't get into that space. But so that was true. And then he, the husband asked her, um, is there something about a color code book? And she goes, oh, yeah, before, you know, before their son died, she said that they um, had this book called the color code book and they had been discussing it. It was about uh, the nature of color to certain emotions or whatever or uh. So it was really a pretty confirming piece of evidence. Interesting. Yeah, I'd like to ask another question about your father. Uh, so he really opened himself in these uh, experiences that he had. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering, did he do any kind of uh, preparations or anything to for protection against uh, negative energies that might uh, come in while he's open like that? He... Um... He did a, sh a short meditation before mm -hmm. anything that he would do. Uh, he was silent. His eyes were shut. It was funny because even if he was doing a demonstration in a public venue, he didn't need very long to get ready. It was just like not even a minute, I think. You know, he would just I, I'd be sitting next to him and I, I'd be talking. And then I look over and his eyes are shut and he's <laughs> in that space. So, yeah, he had a preparatory process. Um, OK. Did he ever give you any predictions about the death of your son? No, but there was two occasions where I don't think that he would tell me that if I couldn't no, stop it, if it was meant to happen right. because it would be too painful. Even like if he came to someone and he knew they had cancer, for example, if it was terminal and they weren't going to make it, he wouldn't say anything. Uh -huh. But if he somehow knew that they could uh, reverse it, if it was treated <clears throat> right away, he would mention it. And he would say, I'm not a medical doctor, but I, rec I recommend that you go get this checked out right away. <laughs> huh. But as far as my son goes, I will say there were two occasions where he looked at Brandon in an odd way, like there was something deeper there that he knew that I didn't know. And mm -hmm. I observed that on two occasions, but nothing was said other than he just says, hi, Brandon, come over here, you know. Um, hmm. So it was just it was just interesting to see that interaction. I I was half very tempted to ask him, like, Dad, did you? is there something about Brandon you want to share but um but that's you know he never did say anything and I for good reason I mean I would have probably yeah. spent all this time worrying trying to avoid that happening you know yeah of course what um what what did your mother think of all this <laughs> oh my mom was really into it um in fact that's the way that they met was uh, my dad at the time I think it was the 19th. They got married in 56, but I think they actually met in 56. So they had a very short courtship. Um, my mother's mother was really into psychics and spiritualism. Uh -huh. And um, her my mom lived in Los Angeles at the time. This is before, obviously, before I was born. She lived in L.A. and her parents lived in Phoenix. So she came to Phoenix. Um, and I guess the psychic in L.A. told her, 
you will meet your husband in Phoenix, Arizona. So she, anyhow, hmm. she went there. Um, my, I guess my grandparents invited her to come because they were, the church they went to had a, a, a psychic coming or a psychic medium coming, my dad, who they had heard really good things about. So they went to see him. Well, lo and behold, uh, they were going to see him on the Sunday service, but it was Saturday night. The uh, minister of the church asked my mom if she'd like to go on a blind date with the visiting minister, and that was my dad. <laughs> wow! Um, <laughs> had some sort of they had a dance or something, so she went to this church <clears throat> dance and met my dad. And then the next day, she saw him demonstrate his abilities for the first time and was completely blown away, as was her mom, <laughs> my grandmother. So that that's how they met, and then uh, so she was totally supportive and into it and everything else, but. Yeah, they were very different people, um, and the marriage lasted uh, 13 years, I think, and then they divorced. Mm -hmm. So, huh. but she always still loved remarried? them. They were good friends. Pardon. They I'm remained sorry. good friends. They remained good friends. Yeah, that's good. Did your dad remarry, or did she? Uh, she didn't for a long time, but eventually did. My dad never did. So, huh. I think he traveled so much and everything else. It would just it's probably pretty hard on a relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, interesting. Mark, uh, you talk about uh, different, in your book, talk about different types of uh, paranormal phenomena, telepathy, precognition, psychometry, remote viewing, uh, psychokinesis. And then you mentioned something I never heard of, remote perturbation. Uh, I guess that's a, a noun Pertubus. form of perturb. Per, per, per uh, uh, can you talk about that? That's uh, You describe it as the ability to perturb or disrupt uh, an otherwise random event through mental means. It's kind yeah, of like it, what Wolfgang Pauli did. <laughs> um, I actually added that one to my list because Stanley Krippner, who endorsed my book, uh -huh. and he wrote the, the, the testimony or uh, review on the back of the book, he's a parapsychologist, highly esteemed. Yeah. But he right. looked at my list. He goes, well, you've left out these ones. So that's one of the ones I added because <laughs> he brought it up. But my understanding of it, it would be like your ability to mentally affect a physical system. Maybe that could be like a random number generator or um, I don't know. Um, I, I think there's a fine line with how some of these things are described. Like we always try and box things in like, well, this uh -huh. is clairvoyance. This is telepathy. Right. This right. is clairvoyance. Yeah. And, and there's an overlap and it's like, well, which is which, you know? Um, but I, yeah, I, my understanding exactly. of that is it would be like your ability to mentally affect some physical system, whether that be um, maybe dice are rolling and you can mentally uh -huh. affect how they come up or something like that, I guess. Well, with um, Wolfgang Pauli, he, was, he would walk into a lab and whatever they were doing would go berserk mm -hmm. without him doing anything, you know, just his presence. Well, I've and seen that physical. with electronics before, too. Yeah. Like, um, when I've actually had medium readings, I had it back before I had digital recorder, I had a cassette recorder and it worked fine. It had brand new batteries and everything. <laughs> I go in to record the session. It would not work. It just wouldn't work. <laughs> then afterward, I, I checked it out and it worked fine. It was just crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. That's like computers so, that go for circ. Yeah. yeah. So these scientists... Uh, that were experiencing this, they, they didn't want to really believe that he had the ability or that uh, that to to affect these uh, experiments, uh, even though he wasn't trying to You're do that. About but the, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the physicist uh -huh. pa, uh, Wolfgang Pauli. So there is one example that's really kind of hilarious, where scientists, uh, I don't know what they were working on, but something happened a test tube blew up or something that uh destroyed the experiment and the the person said uh well at least we can't blame it on wolfgang Pauli." well it turns out that <laughs> at that time wolfgang Pauli was on a train and it was stopped uh very close by to where that lab was uh, temporarily and that's that was when it that happened so you know th that could be called remote uh Tribulation, but it, uh, yeah, or or synchronicity. I noticed you didn't you didn't use synchro include synchronicity in your list. Uh, so, what's your take on synchronicity? Well, it includes it in the book, though. Yeah, yeah. I have a, a, yeah. a whole chapter on synchronicity, actually, right. and I've had so many instances of it; it's crazy. Um, but I, I just 
yeah, I can't explain what's behind it. I just think it kind of shows that there's a plan and a uh -huh. pattern to our lives and there's meaning to life. Uh, one of the examples, I think I, well, I didn't even share this in the book, but it's a good one. So in 2014 in May, my, our older son got married um, three months later and he was <clears throat> up in Portland, Oregon. That's why we're here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we were going to come see them over the July 4th holiday and we were talking like, well, maybe we should get a condo up there because, you know, they're probably going to have kids and we'll be 1,300 miles away. Um, so one day before leaving uh, to come see them in Portland, I get a call from a recruiter and he says, hey, Mark, I've got the perfect job for you, but I don't think you want it because you'd have to move. I'm like, well, where to? He says, Portland, Oregon. I'm like, oh, You're wow. kidding. I'm going there tomorrow. <laughs> so I ended up getting it. I got interviewed during that visit and then uh, came back a week later for a second interview and then got offered the job and drove the 1300 miles three months later. So Jeez. that's pretty synchronistic. Yeah, that's very <laughs> that, synchronistic. That, that's incredible. Definitely. Yeah, I, I saw I haven't had a chance to read that chapter yet. I did see that. I'm by the way, I'm really enjoying your book. I, I you know, haven't had a chance to finish it, but uh, just going over it in different different places. Uh, I like the 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 scientific uh, stuff that you look mm -hmm. at uh, 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 that's very interesting as well as the stories and uh, I'm gonna put your book up uh, on my desktop so I can access <laughs> it easily to read from time to time. Well, thank you. I, I try. I know it's a little different approach than a lot of people have done. It, usually, you see something that's like a scholarly academic book, or uh -huh. you see something that's like personal stories that are anecdotal right. stories. This is a marriage of the two because what I wanted to do is share because I had so many experiences. I share those, but then I provide the supportive information, the research that's been done within the field um, to to tag on to that. So some people will be more interested in just the stories, some were just in the science, and a lot of readers will like both, you know, the marriage yeah. of the two. What's the difference you, between Soul Shift and this book? Soul Shift was my first book. It's uh, my memoir. Okay. Uh, and really about the journey I took after Brandon passed. Okay. Kind of going back to the dad I grew up with and how I uh -huh. just kind of set that on the side and didn't really pay attention to it and how this thrust me back into that field. And then uh, some of the unusual um, experience that we have. I'll give you one that's not even related to mediumship, but it's just, you know, it's really phenomenal. So the day that Brandon was hiking, um, there was another group of people that got there and tried to help, but they were too late. And one of the the people in that group, his name is James Linton. Turned out he was a musician, guitar, played guitar, composed music, and sang. Um, we became friends with him because we didn't know who he was, but he found us through an online obituary and he wrote, hey, I was on the mountain. Please contact wow. me if you want to talk. So we connected with him and became friends. Well, six months after Brandon passed, we went on a cruise and the cruise was originally going to be to celebrate Brandon's graduation from high school. But since he wasn't physically able to go with us, we took his older brother and his buddy, Stu. Stu had been on the mountain and tried <laughs> to resuscitate Brandon that day. So we took, the four of us went. Um, so um, if you go back, well, this is ties in. Six months earlier, two weeks after Brandon died, I saw my, the first intuitive I ever saw, this woman said, <laughs> You're going to, I think you're going to see Brandon at the side of your bed within six months. So now it's six months later, we go on this cruise. Before we left, uh, James Litton asked if he could borrow Brandon's bass guitar. Brandon was a bassist. So James had the studio. He had guitars, but he didn't have a bass. So we loaned him the bass. We go on the trip. We get back. The day, right as we get home, Susie sits at the foot of our bed. And while she's there, she feels the presence of Brandon and she sees him as a shadow figure out of her peripheral vision. She wow. knows it's him. The very next day, James Linton calls us and he says, Hey, Susie, I've got to share something with you, but I don't know how to tell you. And she's like, well, she thought he broke the bass, but no, it wasn't that. <laughs> uh, he said, well, I was recording the song in the studio. And while I was in there, I felt the presence of someone else in there with me. And I saw a shadow figure out of my peripheral vision and I saw flashes of white light. I thought I was hallucinating. So I went and drank some water. I took a shower. I ate something. But every time I came back, it got stronger and stronger. Huh. And then finally, he said, I, I said, OK, Brandon, what do you want? And then he was driven to redo the lyrics to this song and the bass line. And he said, it's the best song I've ever written, but I didn't write it. It's called The Other Side. 
So um, oh. Oh. I thought it was, you know, even aside from the song, just the mere fact that he had an identical experience to my right. wife one day later without knowing about hers was pretty phenomenal. That's, that's a powerful synchronicity. <laughs> Well, huh. and I was I was gonna wait till the I was gonna wait till the end of the podcast to ask this, but this might be a good time to ask it. So, what are the two guitars behind you on the wall? Oh, uh, <laughs> actually, the the one in oh, the middle is three. Music. There's three. Yeah, yeah. So the the one in the middle is um Four, Brandon's actually. bass. That okay. was Brandon's bass, and I kept oh, it because wow. I use it because I play guitar and I I record songs. Uh, the one on the left is a new Gretsch that I just got. Uh, it's it's a chambered guitar, so it's hollow inside, but no no cutouts. And then the one on the right's a uh, Fender Paramount. And then this is the guitar I play the most. There's it's a, a oh, wow Stratocaster, American made Stratocaster. So. That's uh, I've got I've got that very guitar myself, uh, <laughs> American made black uh, uh, single coils. Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. I just I love the scratch, but the, I just love the Stratocaster even more. <laughs> it's just like playing; it's like butter to play that. Oh, sorry, sorry for the audio. No, that's okay. I'm uh, sorry for the audio folks that can't see the guitars, but go to the YouTube channel; you can see the guitars. So. <laughs> right. Well, you know, John, you just lost two friends. Uh, do you have any questions for Mark about? Uh, that? Oh, wow, I hadn't even thought about that really well, um and 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 interesting thing is is that uh one one of the two well actually both of them uh we we shared a lot uh a lot of our friendship was based around music mm -hmm. uh and in so much as going uh the first friend chris that passed away uh uh um we just went to a lot of concerts together the uh, second friend that passed away uh, went to a lot of concerts together, but he came to a lot of my band's concerts and uh, was really, really uh, was much closer to uh, uh, the guitar player and the uh, drummer in the band. Uh, he they were he was he was their uh, big big brother in the uh, fraternity when they first went to college. But uh, but yeah, um, so you yeah, a lot of synchronicities with those that involve music. Right, it does. Yeah. Um. um Oh, that's cool. If you ever decided you wanted to check out a medium, you could go to my medium certification site. Sure, sure. Just yeah. to touch on that lightly, why I've developed that after Soul Shift came out, I had a bunch of people ask me for recommendations. And at the time, I had probably knew half a dozen really good mediums, but these are more like celebrity mediums like Alison Dubois. Uh -huh. And they had long wait lists. Um, and some of them charge more than people wanted to pay. So I thought there's got to be other people with this ability that are just lesser known. So I put together a program. Uh, I leaned on uh, the process that was used by Dr. Emily Williams Kelly at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies in a mediumship research she had done. And also uh, my friend, Tricia Robertson, who was the president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research. So I developed these testing protocols. And what it boiled down to is I do, if someone wants to apply for certification, they have to go through five blinded readings via Zoom with no video. Uh, okay. They're just given the first name of the person that they're that's the sitter. And then these readings are recorded and then later transcribed and graded for accuracy. Huh. And so the people who have passed have had a high degree of, <laughs> of statistical accuracy and pertinence to the sitter in the readings. So that's what it is. And today, this I've been doing this for nine and a half years. I have 41 people who have been certified. Wow. That's and they're all over the yeah, they're all over the world and they're at all different price points. Um, most of them do the readings by Zoom, but some could do it in person if you really wanted that. Um, that's a resource. But um, my website has a link to that. It has a link to videos of my dad on the Steve Allen show in 1971 that are pretty Jeez. cool. I also have a link to the Helping Parents Heal. And then if you want to check out my music, I have a link to my own music, too, because I did a studio album of original songs last year. So kind of all over the oh. board. And one of the songs is called What You Can't See. It's a spiritual song. And it's really addressed to the skeptic debunker type. Uh -huh. So the people who don't believe in anything. Um, to, so it's a musical approach to try and open up their minds. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, all approaches are welcome. <laughs> oh, yeah. and my, you'll probably post this, but my website is markirelandauthor.com. Mark okay. with a K, Ireland, like the country author, markirelandauthor.com. And all those links are available there. Now, speaking great. of... 
Speaking of celebrities, uh, your father uh, worked with uh, a number of uh, famous people, didn't he? Uh, they came to him for readings, or uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, he became Mae West's personal psychic. Um, really? And, oh, oh, yeah. I got to meet her when I was 19. I got to actually go Jeez. tour her apartment. And uh, oh. my dad's such a character. We went into her bedroom, and he goes, would you mind if my son sits on your bed so he can say he's been in Mae West's bed? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, but uh, also, I know he had connections with Glenn Ford, uh, David Jansen. Huh. Um, uh, I met Amanda Blake, too, from Miss Kitty from Gunsmoke. That's uh -huh. going back a long right. ways. Wow. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, yeah. And then I have a what's I think most impressive. I have a card from the White House from Mamie Eisenhower addressed to my dad in 1956 and it was congratulating him on behalf of her and the president on getting married to my mom so that wow. told me that he must have probably counseled them as well so huh that's it interesting. that's interesting yeah i wonder i mean eisenhower was kind of an interesting character he i think he believed in ufos <laughs> maybe you know i know his wife was definitely open to to yeah. this stuff and I don't know whether, you know, maybe he was as well. I don't know if he counseled them both. I don't, it's kind of crazy to think that if he had asked my dad for, you know, direction on <laughs> stuff pertaining to the country, <laughs> oh, I would assume it was probably more personal things, but. Huh. Yeah, Mark, you have quite a few uh, things to say about skeptics. Uh, you have a couple of chapters uh, in a row that, uh, you know, uh, talk about, people who are very skeptical and the difference between uh, skepticism and uh, I don't know what you would call it, just uh, uh, inability to change their opinions, uh, even when they, they see evidence that, uh, you know, that it should open their minds some. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And Sure. Um, I think skepticism is a healthy thing for anybody to have, uh, as long yes. as you're open-minded. You know, you have to ask, yeah. you have to question things and make sure that they make sense uh, to you personally. But there are some people who've already made their mind up and it's a dogmatic position. It's just like somebody who's a, a really hardcore fundamentalist religious person. It is a religion. Mm -hmm. It's just a religion of of, of nihilism um, that basically says uh, uh, we're just physical beings. Uh, consciousness is generated by the brain. When the brain dies, you uh -huh. die. There's nothing more than that. Um, so it's like this stand that they take without, you know, and they're not open to considering any alternative to that. Why that is, it's hard for me to say. I think it's a psychological thing, probably as much as anything. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes maybe it's a by. I think for some of it's a byproduct of having grown up in a very strict religious household mm -hmm. um, and have, you know, and have that the Bible thumping kind of take place. And it's a rebellion against that for some of them, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's it's an unhealthy state from my perspective, because, you know, if you want to explore things and find the truth, you have to look at all the evidence that's out there, um, you know, and they'll try and disregard any, any tests or scientific uh -huh. research that's been done in this field is like, oh, that's pseudoscience. Well, they're trying to put up walls around what's science and what's not just based on their, their own preferences. Um, and so, you know, to them, it's got to be physically measurable. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, it's not real. But that's their mm -hmm. hang up. I, you know, when I wrote that book and those chapters, I was really not so much wanting to battle them, but to just make people aware of that approach so that they wouldn't fall for it. Because if they're told, like, um, that, oh, this stuff's fake, there's no way it's real. Mm -hmm. and, and then they believe that without questioning it, then you're kind of limiting yourself. So, I'm just trying to arm the average person with an understanding of what these debunker types do and and actually some of the ploys they use to to discredit people who may have abilities mm -hmm. um, in, in kind of a, a devious manner. <laughs> so I get into that. Right. There was a, a researcher in England. He's passed since Montague Keene, and he talked about um, a, a TV production that was being done to investigate whether these things, whether psychic phenomena was real and mediumship was real. And what they found was that the editing that was done took out all the evidential parts and they were just oh, showing God. things that make them look bad. So it was really, wow. really bad, uh, but it was clearly a, a ploy on their part. And then 
um, James Randy, who's now deceased, he was yeah. this, you know, the the bunker type. He would try and do a cold reading to prove like, oh, see, I can do this and I'm not psychic, but he just flopped in a major way, but they edited that out. So they just crafted yeah. the editing of this to make the psychics look bad and not show any of the positives. So, and the, I guess the live studio audience could see through that and uh, was not pleased about it. And I don't know if they booed or what, but. Uh, Years yeah. ago, we met James Randy. He oh, was a jerk. I mean, <laughs> just, he, uh, this guy was just, he was so annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, it was at a, actually an archaeological e event uh, at, in, in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, afterwards, was, oh, so... yeah, after afterwards, uh, he was putting, so, he gave some kind of presentation there and we had asked a couple questions. And um, afterwards, we were in the par parking lot. It was dark and uh around and at night and he was putting some equipment away and uh i just walked up to him and said uh randy we've been f uh f following your your career it's very interesting you know just a very <laughs> general comment and he got so frightened he rushed to his car and uh <laughs> you know, closed the door locked the door like i i think he was very uh, afraid that you know, he's he very paranoid being, yeah, uh, under under assault, which you know yeah. we had no intention of uh, harming him or doing anything like that. So, wow. but uh, I guess that's just how he lived. Uh, that fear. Well, that's not a very happy way to live. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I always wonder. Well, okay, James, now that you're dead, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, that that's a good. You one. know, tell us. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, I, I do point. wonder sometimes when someone like that passes what I do too. What, what happens because they they can't, you know, for them they can't accept the reality of that and then they're there. Do they think they're still alive and they're I earthbound know. then? Because they don't <clears throat> they don't realize that you know that they actually have physically died. I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it but somebody I don't know if this was a psychic or somebody else who told me, well, when a skeptic dies, there's a place they can go where they can learn what what's really going on i guess kind of like a school or something yeah um, and another thing i've heard from the religious uh point of view where people who are very religious uh might after their death they might go to church uh all the time uh and because this is what they believe that they're in heavy heaven and this is uh, uh, what they should be doing and then but gradually it just kind of falls away when they realize that <laughs> well this is just my, what i'm creating and uh, everything yeah. is what i'm creating yeah it's more of a mentally constructed uh -huh. world is my understanding yeah 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 that's well well maybe we'll hear from randy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to ask one of my mediums if they can tap into him. I don't know if they want to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Want yeah. To. <laughs> yeah. Is he still skeptical? That's uh, that. That's uh, about the afterlife. How that's... could you be? I mean, if you're dead, <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, people's They're... beliefs and who they are don't doesn't immediately fade away. I think when you pass, <laughs> that's you true. Know, yeah. You kind of are who you are. <laughs> it's and it's and it's and it's all energy but there's some negative energy too and if you tune into that uh that's uh, that's what uh you know people fear a lot of people fear like in uh religious people that uh anything that's related to the the paranormal is um uh, evil the related <laughs> the devil's work right and there is something to the negative energy but it's all like i said it's all energy uh, yeah, I think, the, what, yeah go ahead no, i was just gonna say at the end of one of my chapters uh, the one on the whole the the chapter on religion and history and all that yeah. i basically what i said is you know a hammer can be used to build a house or to tear a house <laughs> down so it's really how True. you apply things and if your motivations are good and you're there to help people then you know uh there's a, a saying attributed to jesus uh that a a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, I know a number of mediums who bear very good fruit because they bring healing and happiness to people. Right. So how could that be a bad thing? Um, right. If someone had ulterior motives um, or were trying to do black magic or whatever, I guess that's a whole other thing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, religious people 
uh, ministers, priests, uh, often uh, some of them say that uh, there's just nothing to the the paranormal. Others say that you know equate it with uh, evil, uh, and but yet they believe in miracles that have happened in the past. And I, I like that you have one uh, quote in your book is. Uh, the uh, uh, person saying, well, there were miracles in the past and there will be in the future, but there's none today. <laughs> right. And that goes back to what I mentioned earlier, this whole idea of there being a special dispensation yeah. of these <laughs> gifts, you know. Well, they had it back then and it'll happen again, you know, uh, in the <laughs> future. Not right, but now. right now, <laughs> it makes no sense. And and scripture yeah. doesn't even say that, but that was the church position, you know, right. to try and diffuse that whole argument. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, hey, one other one other comment I want to make before we end here, we're coming to the end of the hour, is um, are you familiar with the Golden Dawn, which was an organization, British organization around the early part of the 20th century uh, that uh, was involved with uh, psychic phenomena? Um, one of the some of the practitioners of in the Golden Dawn were involved in micro remote viewing. In other words, they they are doing remote viewing to look at uh, what they found to be what they described basically were, were subatomic particles that at the time were unknown to science. And uh, the amazing thing is what they were describing then became a reality when uh, quantum science found out uh, that particles are smaller than atoms. And uh, so this is uh, one uh, example I've used with skeptics, uh, and they have no explanation. They just don't want to believe that that really happened, that that these people were able to micro remote view. But it's 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 factual information that uh, that is available that they they saw and uh, described subatomic articles uh, particles before that. Uh, mm -hmm we were known that science uh, recognized them i hadn't heard that that's pretty cool um yeah it's pretty amazing i had heard i'm trying to think of which medium it was back probably 17 1800s i can't think of his name right now but he had described um basically atomic structure back way before you know um there was any way he could have known that uh -huh. was it was rather interesting I, right i i uh who was that um, oh, yeah, well. I, I, yeah, um, I, I read drop. that section in your book it. too. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't it's, remember the remember who it was now either. But that's uh, cool. I hadn't heard of them. I'll, I'll have to uh, do some research yeah, on that. Read yeah, about that. Golden, Golden Dawn. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Wasn't Alice Bailey part of that? Right, and Madame no, Velatsky. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. And a darker figure too, Alex. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Alistair Huxley. Yeah, Al Alistair was it? No, Huxley? Alistair Crowley. 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 Right. Not Huxley. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> That's the thing. Aldous Huxley. No. Yeah, right. <laughs> he was not yeah. part of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crowley was a interesting character, but it sounds like he was more leaning toward the darker stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Does. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark, okay. this has just been great talking with you. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It was, it and was please fun tell, tell everybody where where we can where they can find you, your books. Yeah, again, uh, if you just go to my website, you'll find everything there. It's markirelandauthor.com, Mark okay. with a K, Ireland like the country, author, markirelandauthor.com. Okay, very and we'll, good. And we'll, have, and we'll send and we'll you a look, link when it goes up. Right, Great. and we'll have to look up your music too. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, a, yeah. there's a link right on... <laughs> On there it's uh, on the right hand side of some of the pages so check it out and especially that okay. track what you can't see yeah that's great okay. Okay. Well, you guys take care yeah, right, thanks, thank you. thanks so much